Uh, thanks. I think we're now um, live. Welcome, everybody, to uh, November Health in Hackney. Um, in terms of apologies for absence, I've had Councillor uh, Patrick, Councillor Garcia, Councillor Samatar, Dr. Copland, and Sophie Dopiera Bull. Um, in terms of um, urgent items of order of business, I haven't been notified of any urgent items. Just in terms of matters of housekeeping, this is obviously a hybrid meeting. We've got a number of people in the chamber. We've got a number of people online. Um, if you're online, please don't start conversations in the chat. Please keep your camera on when it's your item. Um, please mute yourself unless you are speaking. Um, if you'd like to get your hand, uh, my attention, please raise the electronic hand. Members of the press um, sometimes uh, watch the live stream. We are being live streamed, or they'll watch the recording afterwards. Um, um, so just be aware of that. Declarations of interest, I haven't been notified of any, but I would just point out um, we're welcome to have with us uh, Councillor Conway here, but uh, she's here not as Councillor Conway, she's here as Sophie Conway, who works for uh, Copperfield, which is one of the uh, groups who are presenting um, to us, just to make that clear. Um, we essentially have two substantive items. Um, the first one that's going to take an hour and a half um, this evening uh, with respect to uh, breast cancer and the second one in terms of the staffing structure of the new place-based system that will take about half an hour. Um, let me just go into the breast cancer item. Um, the way I intend to chair it, we've got six fantastic presentations and I say at this stage thank you very much to Jarleth as always for pulling this together um, uh, so ably. Um, what my intention is on the breast cancer is to go through the presentations in this order and when I come to each presentation I'll introduce the respective people at that stage rather than do a whole list now. Um, and then once we had a presentation, say five or seven minutes, five to seven minutes, I'll then open it up for a couple of questions just to keep the flow going and then I'll go on to the next presentation couple of questions and do it that way and leave about half an hour or 40 minutes at the end. So members, if four hands go up, I'm only going to take two of you at every stage and I'll try and rotate round. So um, I'm going to chair it in that way to try and keep the flow going. The order, just so everybody knows, is firstly we're going to go to public health, secondly we're going to go to the screening service, thirdly we're going to go to the alliance, fourthly we're going to go to primary care, fifthly to, uh, to secondary care, and finally we're going to go to Copperfield. Okay, then um, with that then, um, just um, to very briefly introduce the item, um, breast cancer, as of 2018, obviously data is one of the issues we might explore today, accounted for one in, one in five new diagnoses of cancer in city in Hackney, and it's an item that we've not looked at um, for a number of years. So it's particular, particularly important we do so. So to set the scene, can I go to public health, please? And then we are going to be joined here by, I know Sandra was hoping to join us, but also Jane Taylor and Abigail Webster from the public health team. So I don't know, uh, Jane, are you, I can't see. Um, I am actually here. Oh, I can't, I've got you, I've got you. <laughs> uh, Sandra. But, but, but I'm not going to be speaking. So just to introduce Jane and Abby and to say thank you to, to both of them and to Carolyn Sharp, who's another consultant in the team for, for pulling this together. Um, over to you, Jay. Thank you. Um, I was actually assuming everybody read the paper, so I wasn't going to actually go through it in very much detail, but maybe to set the scene, if that's OK. Um, and if there's any specific questions, I can go through the detail. I just don't want to just read it off the paper. So I think you've already highlighted, uh, Councillor Hayhurst, that so breast cancer is common and it's a, it's a major cause of premature death. Um, Age is the main risk factor, but it is the leading cause of death um, also in female Hackney residents under 50. Um, and that there are inequalities in breast cancer risk. Some of those are modifiable, some of them are not, and some of them are outlined in the paper. And there are also inequalities in outcomes from breast cancer. Um, almost a quarter of breast cancer cases are thought to be preventable by taking action on some of those modifiable risk factors and Im improved access to screening, et cetera. Um, and what we do know is outcomes are significantly improved, as with all cancers, if cancer is identified early and treated quickly. 
Um, and I think one of the things that I did really want to flag, you've already alluded to it, is that as other partners' papers have also um, highlighted, access to up-to-date local data on breast cancer, particularly around some of the inequalities, is far from optimal. And it does hamper our efforts to respond to local need. But what we do know is that incidence is relatively low overall so that's the sort of number of the number of new cases the rate of new cases and that is consistent with areas of comparatively high deprivation you do see tend to see lower incidence but then what you do say at the same time is survival rates being relatively poor for various reasons survival rates are improving locally but they are relatively low um Breast screening coverage, you've seen in all the papers, well, most of the papers, I think, is uh, is historically has lagged behind national standards and other areas. And there are some significant inequalities, but then some gaps in that data. Um, and also we're seeing that late diagnosis, it does lead to poorer outcomes for some groups. Um, that does include people living in more deprived areas. It does include younger age groups. And it does, there is evidence to suggest that um, poorer outcomes through late diagnosis are a consequence for black women and also there's some research around Asian women as well but it's not very detailed that data. I think one of the things I did just want to say is that some of the evidence around younger age of diagnosis in black women could at least be in, in part be due to the younger age profile of that population but it's not really very clear from the research and we definitely don't have that data well we do have some data locally but nothing that could really confirm that so there are some there is some sort of uncertainty around some of the evidence and data but just to flag if anybody wanted it which i could share after nice did actually publish a review of inequalities in breast cancer earlier this year uh, it's got quite a lot of detail in there it's not all completely consistent but it's actually quite interesting and it's 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 national data but it is quite interesting so I, i'll pause at that point because i think lots of others will have things to add to to some of some of the information there. Um, Jane, just before I then open it up to colleagues for questions, just on this data point, mm. um, do you sort of have a, a, a sort of a practical and financially achievable suggestion, as it were, within the, within the system at the moment as to how that data could be garnered going forward in a sort of workable, proportionate way? So I might bring my colleague Abby in on this because she's been doing quite a lot of work trying to we used to have access to a lot more local data um, pre ICSs and I think some of the barriers are actually nationally um, and so it's quite difficult to know what we can do locally apart from lobby for that but Abby did you want to say anything about some of your efforts to get access to some of that data? I think it's just to echo what you say really Jane um, we yeah we've, we've, we've gone through a bit of difficulty trying to get access to data but it's not uncommon it's not just hackney that don't have access to data and it's it's especially since the merger of the integrated care board that we've not been able to get specific hackney data now lots of our data is uh, merged for northeast london and also a lot of the data we've got access to isn't broken down by demographics so we can't see differences by age or sex or ethnicity what we have done um is made an application to i think it's the national these registration service um, or via them to try and get access to more data. That is that request is currently sat with them at the moment. They're they're being slightly slow about it, but um, trying to get us through to a point where we might be able to actually get access to that data. And we're going to be doing that if it's possible at a northeast London level, so that it's not just for Hackney that we get access to, and we can have a united front and try and see more. And, and but sorry, Abby. So that, that the body that you mentioned that may hold it that sits nationally. That and they what commission the screening service, and it's 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 sort of as part of NHS England. I'm just trying to understand wh where they sit. So they set the National Disease Registration Service is a national body, as as the title suggests. But the data sets that we're asking for access to sit in various places. So um, largely NHS, but you've got screening data, you've got incidence data. They, they fall under lots of different areas within the NHS. Okay. Thank you. Um, members, I'll take uh, Councillor Adams. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, you said that locally uh, locally uh, breast screening coverage lag behind national standard 
and significantly inequalities in coverage and uptaking remains. What are the factors responsible? What are the factors responsible for this? I can come in, but you might actually find that useful to pose to somebody from the screening program, um, and also from the North East London Cancer Alliance, because we've actually they've actually done some research looking at um, some of the drivers behind that. And I think one of the papers, which I now don't have in front of me because it's on my screen, does actually go through um, a whole host of potential reasons for. Some of it is about lack of awareness. Some of it is um, lack of trust. Some of it is stigma. Some it's some of it is just like in, you know not being deemed as services for them or inconvenience it's there's a whole host of things and it's quite complex and it really varies depending on who you're talking about but I, I think some of the cancer screening colleagues might and North East London colleagues might be able to answer, answer, answer that who've commissioned some of the research. Thank you well then um, I'm including Mohana did two questions there, so I'm going to come on to the next area and then I'll wrap, wrap, wrap back round again for another round of questions. So um, can I now just move on then to the screening service um, and their um, presentation for members um, starts at um, page 19 with a helpful um, sort of data set at page 22. So we welcome uh, Claire Mabina, who's the lead breast cancer nurse, and also Dr. Nancy Tara, the health promotional lead for the screening service. So Claire, are you, are you starting off? Mute, Claire, I think. Can you hear me now? Got you. Okay. Lovely. Hi, evening, everyone. Um, so my name is Claire Mabena. I'm the lead nurse for um, the Central and East London Breast Screening Service, um, which covers your population. So with regard to the screening population, they're invited every three years. Um, to their local screening site for their breast screening um, appointments. Um, within the screening program itself, obviously it's gone through a lot of changes um, post pandemic. With regard to the Central and East London Breast Screening Service, we have fully recovered and we're now in the smoothing out phase of screening the Central and East London population. Um, currently, we have moved from the open invitation system to timed appointments. So we know statistically with doing this, there is a greater uptake of appointments. We generally see a loss of between 10 and 20% of uptake when you send out open um, screening appointments. And that was um, what was happening during the recovery process. But given that we have now moved back to the timed appointment for your population, we are hoping that we will see a significant increase in uptake again, as we did with pre-pandemic levels. Um, with regard to the community itself, we are doing lots of different health promotion initiatives to try and encourage um, attendance at screening. Um, and these vary from targeted approaches to local community groups um, that we have done, as well as trying to read hard to, group, hard to reach groups like those with learning difficulties. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Mansi, who will just give you a quick insight to the different health promotion initiatives that we have ongoing, trying to reach those harder to, to reach populations, if that makes sense. Thank you, Claire. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so as Claire mentioned, um, we've had the health promotion team in place uh, this year, and we are, one of our main projects is to reduce health inequalities and improve uh, access to screening for people with learning disabilities. And for this project, we have been actively engaged with the learning disability team in Hackney. And we've uh, actually been able to um, call women who have women with learning disabilities who have missed their appointment uh, to their to their uh, book them into. Used with uh, doing targeted sessions with the women uh, have pre visits at our centers and essentially implement all the standard reasonable adjustments that they're offered uh, as uh, from a point of uh, view of health equity. Um, we've also um, engaged with um, the, the Hackney uh, Council newsletter. So we had uh, a newsletter with our health promotion during Breast Cancer Awareness Month go out with our community champions sending out a message uh, from, uh, you know, 
from the Learning Disability Group. Um, we have also partnered with the Leanne Perro Foundation, and we're working um, doing more. Let's see if that helps. To engage with GPs um, going forward in the borough, and uh, we have iPads in place on all of our screening sites uh, to bridge the language barrier at some level. So when people come in for their appointment, um, we do have translation services, but sometimes they don't get screened because they can't identify themselves as well. So we have Google Translate with iPads in place so that we can actually uh, have the identification and uh, facilitate um, ease of communication at that uh, point as well. Um, thanks, Nancy. And um, we, we lost a little bit there. She froze a couple of times. So I don't know, maybe for the Q&A, it might help just to turn off your camera because that might just uh, reduce the broadband uh, uh, load. Uh, I'm sorry about that. No, it's all right. No, no I think we, we, we certainly got the, uh, the large chunk of it and the gist. Um, thank you both. Um, members, do we have any um, questions for the screening service at um, this stage? I mean, I had, I had, Councillor Kennedy, are you? Yeah, could they just talk about if they have any degree of flexibility about choice of who is eligible for screening or is it all fixed nationally? So the eligible population or women between the ages of 50 and 70 um, and they will be called up at some point before their 53rd birthday up until um, just under 71 and after the age of 70 ladies can self-refer every three years um, does that answer your question That's is, in line. Is, is, is there any flexibility there to extend those parameters or being perhaps target more within them um, with regard to the age range that's set nationally um, we did have an age extension trial which was ongoing for a number of years um, that stopped, um, paused at the pandemic, and we're waiting on the results of that age extension analysis with regard to extending um, the screening program. Now, I know Caroline Cook is on here, um, so she may have more information in relation to when that will be available, but the age extension trial was where we were screening younger ladies between the age of 47 um upwards and then the older group um from the age of 71 to 73 um but the data in relation to that trial hasn't yet been released um i presume when that is available they will then analyze whether extending the national screening program to a younger population and an under older population and the benefits um that that may or may not bring would be available to us at that point but right now we pretty much work within the the national guidance in relation to screening age. Councillor before did you have a question? Yes. Well, can you just put your microphone on there so everyone can I'm sorry, thanks. Um some of the barriers for attending the barrier screening says medical racism. And what exactly that that means and what kind of measures that you think can be put in place to address that? Again, we look at all reasonable adjustments across the sector to encourage everyone to attend. But yes, there are definitely language barrier is one of the big things um, that we've come across, which is why it's so important to get out there into communities. What we often find is having community champions within those community groups to help spread the positive message can really, really help. Um, so it really is Mansi and the team have really been engaging with local community groups. We've had real success with the Somali community, um, reaching out to them and doing one-on-one -on -one workshops with them in the community. And like I said, the community champion training um, that Mansi's team support in delivering, again, helped to break down some of those barriers. But you know, I think there's a lot more that, that can be done, but I think it really is about getting into the depths of the local community um with the specialist teams and then doing training on the ground within those communities to spread the word in relation to breast awareness and the importance of attending your your breast screening appointments 
Um, thank you, um, Claire. And just on the, 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 the slide deck at page 22, um, where we see uptake, um, we can see in 2022 to 2023, it was 40.6. Um, but for the, for the current year, we, it's gone up to 51.3, but that's just on the April data. Is that because, is that because the May through to September data hasn't been processed yet? Um, so yeah, so with screening data, um, it takes six months. So from the point of invitation, um, the invitee has six months in which to attend. So hence the reason we only have data up until that period. So we process map it at that, at that interval, if that makes sense. Okay, I'll take one more now, Councillor Tugdalov. Thank you, Chair. It's just a follow-up on, on that. Um, what happens when people don't take that screening? How do you manage the follow-up on that after the six months? What's the plan? So if they don't take their invite up within that six-month period, they can call at any time. They don't have to wait until the next screening round length. Um, so we are working closely with GPs um, in the area. We're giving them advice on how to engage with those non-attenders um, and supporting that with doing some outreach work to the non-attenders so that they can encourage them to call up and book at any point in time. But in relation to the data itself, it will only get accredited to the surgeries if it's within that six-month time frame. But as we know, if we can get ladies to attend one appointment, the likelihood is they will attend subsequent appointments. So with any point in that three-year round length, if a patient has missed their appointment for whatever reason, they can contact the hub and rebook an appointment at their nearest location at their convenience. Um, thank you, Claire. I think I've probably got a few more questions, but I think I want to keep things moving and then I'll... Um... I'll, I'll, we'll come back. Um, can I next go to the Alliance, which is the North East London um, Council Alliance, and we're joined here by Caroline Cook and Femi Odderwell. And the papers with respect of this are at page 27, going through um, to 38. And as I understand it, you, you sit across along the ICS patch and you, you've got all the cancers within your portfolio and you've prepared this presentation on, on, on breast cancer for us. Um, is, it, is it Caroline who's um, going to start the presentation? Yeah, sure. Sorry, I've got my camera off because um, I keep freezing. So, well, the screen keeps freezing like every 30 seconds or so. So I'm going to keep my camera off in the hope that, that it helps. Um, do you want me to share or... Share my oh. screen or someone oh, I, th I think that, no, I think bearing in mind if you've got um freezing issues, we've all got the papers, so you carry on and we we've got them in front of us. I'll just talk through what I've got then. I'll just talk through the slides. Okay. So um yeah, so the first thing I suppose would just I just thought I'd set out the role of the cancer alliances so everyone would understand what the role of the cancer alliance is in um, breast cancer screening. So we're not a commissioning organisation, and we just um, we set, but we do work with with all of our stakeholders, so the breast screening services and everything, to to try and, and reach the goals that we've been set by NHS England. So how how screening feeds into uh, to increase participation in cancer screening to help to diagnose seventy five percent of cancers at an earlier stage. Um, so we we work to try and work work across all stakeholders to bring this together so we do work with public health colleagues we work with uh, screening um, services as i've said we work with patients and community groups and the hope is to increase the awareness of cancer screening services particularly in those areas where we know populations have um, low participation rates um, so we don't fund anything that's business as usual but we do like seed fund and and um work on proof of concept and stuff like that so um we've also funded in the past uh or supported the des and funded community organizations to give 
to, to do that um, outreach work for us. Um, so just going through some of the data for breast screening, I mean, I, I don't know what if you have just looked at data, so I might be just repeating myself, apologies if I am, but um, this was the data that I took from NHS Futures, which shows breast screening uptake um, up to March 2023, and I think that Claire was just explaining why there's a lag in the data. So, um, but this just shows City and Hackney, how City and Hackney perform against North East London as a whole, uh, and then London and England. So, as you can see, North East London isn't doing doing that well, and um, City and Hackney, for many reasons, I'm sure, has, um, is also quite low. So, the next one is the screening coverage. Um, so, again, so it's a little bit better, but oh, I think it looks a bit better, but um, again, it's the same kind of picture, really. And Caroline, can you just explain what is the difference between coverage and uptake? The, 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 the two slides, what's the difference? Right. So I am going to ask my, one of my colleagues from the screening service to explain this because I can explain it, but I probably won't do it as well as they will, if that's OK. Fine. Well, you, you carry on, Caroline. I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll okay. double up back there. OK, no worries. Um, so this, this next couple of slides just shows, again, by coverage and uptake, the uh, how the worst and the best performing practices. And I know that sounds a bit horrible. I don't mean to sort of single them out, but you can just it just gives you an idea of the difference in um, performance. So you can see that in March 2023, the Hoxton surgery screening uptake there was like 39 percent. So just just under 40 percent so and with the actual target being 80 percent that's actually really low but also the the greenhouse walk-in which you would expect to be low anyway so though that was very low um it's it's not the same kind of surgery i'm assuming so that but there's the uptake of the yeah sorry coverage is very low but even the highest performing is still like 54 percent uh, and then we see the same for uptake. Again, that, that looks looks better. Um, if you're the highest performing practice in the least surgery at 60%. Um, but when we look at the average, as we sort of like we look at it across the whole of North East London or even by borough, and that's what NHSE will be looking at as well, measuring us against when you've got you could have a couple of really high performing borough um, practices, uh, but then you get some that's so low, it really brings it, it brings the average down. So the next slide, there's definitely caveats attached to this. So this data where I've got breast screening coverage, it's um, a snapshot of the 1st of October of that's taken from the clinical effectiveness dashboards, which are the dashboards that are produced for the practices to look at to help with their PCN deaths. So it, it pulls the data directly from the EMIS system. So the problem with that is not every single practice, but pretty much, maybe apart from one or two, use EMIS. Um, and the data is, that they pull out is only as good as the data that's been put in. So for breast screening, because um, they rely on manual coding of the results at practice level, uh, if the practice doesn't put the right doesn't code things correctly or doesn't code things at all. Sometimes you see the odd practice that has such a low um, uptake and coverage that you think actually they're probably missing quite a few patients off there. Um, so if it's if the data isn't good that's put in, the data that comes out isn't great. So the accuracy of this is a guidance, but probably not the most effective. And, and Caroline, this is this is Hackney. This is the the practices within Hackney you, you pulled this from. Yes, sorry, this is just for the Hackney practices. So we're looking. This is like the number. So you can see if people with a learning disability, only like thirty, so less than a, a quarter of them were screened. Um, and same with someone with an SMI, and also homeless people. Um, but only just over just over a quarter, so almost a third, I suppose, of people in the total population were screened. That That's in the three years leading up to the 1st of October. Caroline, I'm just trying to get so my head around this. 
Can I just, just stop you there, just to explain this. So the, the breast screening service send out the letters, but yeah. then it's down to the GP practices to input the result of who attends yeah, because of the, the screening the service. Don't Is that go, right? The, sorry, the, um, the screening service sends the, the letters back to the GP practice that the results go back or if they've not attended that goes back by post and then these practices manually code the um, the results into the system. And, and just to be clear, is, is it because there is no way that the screening service have got at, because we've got so many individual GP practices you might have yeah. all different framework so that's why it doesn't work with the screening service inputting the data? Yeah, sorry, I, I you cut out for a minute there, but I think you're asking if they have the if they don't have the electronic way of doing it. Basically, it doesn't go in electronically like like you did with the bowel screening service. The results will go automatically into the patient record, so we don't have the same problems with that. But just where the breast cancer screening services were set up, probably quite a long time ago, um, they don't have the same mechanisms for. For, for the results to go directly into the patient record. So it has to be done manually. And, and, and if th that wanted to be changed, would that have to be something that they nationally do with sort of how computer programs work? Or is, is, could the decision to be able to do that locally be made? Um, as far as I'm aware, and we've had these discussions with the regional team for uh, NHSC, the screening teams, that um, we know that it's done in I think Surrey and Sussex, they found a way to do it. But I think with all the changes that are happening with breast screening and the fact that it's going to go out to be re-procured, they in London they haven't wanted to to make that change. They would rather make the change across the whole of London, for example. So yes, it would have to be, I mean, it would make sense to do it. Um, but it is a, a a massive piece of work, I should imagine. And it will be done by the commissioning service, which is NHS England. I'm sorry, Carol. Sorry. Um, say, carry on, Carol. Do you, want, do, you, do you want to finish off? Before? Yeah. Okay. So, um, again, so this was the breast screening coverage by ethnicity that we pulled from the same. This is from September. This was another snapshot. And, um, it shows quite like variation across across different ethnicities, and there's quite a lot where we've got. I think it's over here, so seventeen percent of of people at the end were unclassified, not stated. Where the, the ethnicity data is missing, which is another issue. And the any other ethnic group that could be anything. That's twenty five percent. Um, but we do see quite a difference in uptake, and it's not always where you think it's going to be. So um, that's quite an interesting thing. But then I just talked about the challenges that we've had to improvement. So, so for intervention development, um, we have real issues accessing data that's kind of quite timely. As you can see, it's out of date. It's not necessarily accurate. Um, and so we, we're never really quite sure if what we're looking at is the most up-to-date stuff and the most accurate of data. Um, and the lack of data that we have by protected characteristics. So it's quite difficult for us to get hold of the ethnicity data. So um, we're trying, we're working with um, Queen Mary's on, on trying to sort of allow, give us regular sort of monthly updates on that data so we can see any changes. But, um, there's quite a lot of barriers just to people in participating. And I'm sure that um, when the screening services were talking, they picked up on this as well. But this is what we have recently got from focus groups and co-production workshops um, and some on street work that were done by a, a marketing agency for us. So there's a lot of um, a lack of trust in health service um, and it's historic and intergenerational. And it's especially in some of the ethnic minorities where there's a real mistrust in because there's been that racialization or medicalization of race, I would say, over the years. Um, lots of cultural problems. So that fatalism that's it doesn't matter I shouldn't I don't need to know about this if I know there's nothing I can do about it or they'd just rather not know people don't think they need it because they feel well or they're too embarrassed to undress 
Um, there's language barriers is a big thing as well. So the invitation letters is the way things are set up. They can't send out letters by um, in in the the language of the preferred language. They will go out initially in English, as far as I'm aware. Um, sometimes it's a lack of knowledge about screening services. It's just not knowing that that they're there and that they're free. Um, a fear of pain. I mean, it might just quite could be quite uncomfortable, but um, it's just that fear of the pain or a, a past experience that hasn't been very good. If you have one bad experience, you might not want to go back. And that's the same across all screening services. Um, there's also in the past been fear of discrimination for like especially for trans and lesbian ladies, people and lesbian ladies, and then some structural barriers maybe just from the screening locations. I think with um, accessibility, if the if they need to be accessed by um, public transport, might be that they have to travel quite far, and and with the cost of living crisis as well, I think people not really wanting to spend the money on that. And I think my final couple of slides, sorry, were just about a couple of um, campaigns that we ran. So um, we worked with the screening services on this as well. And this is just, this was the first one was the No Time for Cancer. And we, it was quite generic. The problem is with the pandemic, I think we were quite aware that for a long time there was quite a, a backlog that, so we didn't want to overwhelm the services. So it was more about saying, if you get your letter, make sure you, go to your appointment or phone if it's an open invitation phone up and make your appointment but not trying to get additional people coming through but just make sure it was able that the screening services could cope um so this was just uh when we sort of played played on the heartstrings a little bit and and had uh women sort of older women with their grandchildren or children so they could sort of like it was like time because you know you make time for your family as well um and and that had that was mostly social media but also on buses and things. so we we've run that again quite recently in october for cancer awareness month but i don't have the results of that yet and another one that we worked on was the um was specifically for trans and um uh, lesbian people by well the lgbtq plus community in northeast london and with which is quite focused in Hackney because there's quite a few venues in Hackney that are LGBTQ plus focused. So that was designed with people from the community and with a, a charity called Live Through This, now called Outpatients, who are the only charity that we're aware of that works specifically with the LGBTQ plus um, community and like for cancer. Um, and we've done quite a lot of work there. A lot of that was uh, like, there was some out of home media, also a lot of social media, and um, some videos and things. So uh, we also coupled that with some training for service providers. So all the breast screening services across London were offered the training to sort of to, to reduce unconscious bias, and uh, that was really well received. So that was good. And sorry, I did have one more slide. Thanks, Caroline. I'm just gonna, if I can, can I just bring you to? I see Femi's hand. I just want to bring a few members in. Um, and then go yeah. on to some other presentations. Uh, Femi, I see Femi, your hands up. Do you, do you want to just make a contribution and I'll bring some members in? Yeah, no, thank you. I'm just conscious that Carol Caroline wasn't here to hear some of the earlier presentations. So I just wanted to kind of bridge bridge um, the Cancer Alliance work um, with, with that of colleagues on here as well. So I, I think the key thing that we all got we all got to highlight that in terms of uptake uh, for breast screening there's, there's some challenges around that and um link linked into what some of my other colleagues mentioned earlier on you know it's it's there are multi factors there's multiple factors that's impacted on this as well we do have challenges um with data i mean that's one one challenge as a cancer alliance we try to work beyond that to try and just um, improve or increase awareness with various different campaigns that we have and working with our communities to try and enhance that and various different groups to do that. Um, again, part of our work moving forward is to continue doing that as well. So as a Cancer Alliance, I guess what we can do is try to have more of that connection with the communities that we are serving and then trying to create awareness programs to try and stimulate uptake, working with our GP partners and working with the various different organizations to doing so. So I just wanted to kind of just pull it all together to say that it's not, you know, it's not an easy, it's not an easy task to increase the uptake for breast screening. 
we do recognize that it, it does link into what colleagues have mentioned in terms of the difficulties as well you know even based on um, ethnicity language barriers um, and the various different things that you'll see in the, in the slides that have been attached but it, it's just really as a cancer alliance we're trying to bridge that piece of work so i just wanted to kind of summarize with that um, so I hope that that kind of just helps to bring no, that part to a close. Thank you. Thank you, Femi. Uh, Councillor Turbidalov. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. That was really helpful. Um, looking at the data, it really is clear the uptake of a screening is really, really low. I mean, in certain places, compared to the national um, target, we are 40% short and that's really scary because it, what worries me is the people that may be developing cancer and they don't know and be on a late diagnosis and that really is you know people's lives um i just wanted to maybe to, to, to check something in case this is worth looking at we in parts of our uh, of hackney especially in, in the world that i mean and actually coincides with the data that we have here um, it's quite difficult to get a GP appointment. So I wonder if there is, if that in itself is a barrier, uh, because we, some areas are really struggling to get through the GP surgery. So I wonder if even just booking that appointment is an issue, um, because in my, even in my own experience, I'm noticing that ta it's getting even more and more difficult to get an appointment. You need to put time aside through the cost of living crisis a lot of us and a lot of residents are really struggling even to have that time off because when such a precarious employment money is really tight we cannot leave those very important appointments just hoping that we don't have anything wrong with our health so can we yeah i just want to hear your thoughts on that thank you um I, sorry i, I think um yes getting a gp appointment is really hard across not just in North East London or Hackney, but everywhere at the moment. But if, if you look at the actual, if we actually look at the figures, there are more GP appointments and more people are being seen. But I just think um, for some reason, it just seems to be harder to get through. So people are talking about waiting three weeks to, to actually see their GP. Um, and I think there's a th few things there. So for screening, it's different because they'll be invited for screening and given the appointment. But but for women that are symptomatic, so someone that might notice a change in their breasts or have a lump, obviously their first port of call is to see the GP and that's what we're telling them to do. So I think, there's, uh, and I've had a conversation about this today, quite interesting. I think there's some education to be done um, with practices, with practice, like the first people that you, someone will contact is the GP receptionist. So I think the receptionist need, and the, the staff on the front line need to sort of have that education about what they should be asking if they hear these certain like symptoms things they should be making sure that they're saying to the patient okay i'll fit you in i can give you an urgent appointment that kind of thing you need to see the gp but i thought i think there's also some education that's needed for patients not just around awareness but also of what they need to be saying to the gp what they need to say to the receptionist when they go to make the appointment so because I think it's, there's a whole generation of people that's quite afraid to to say say or say they don't want to talk to the receptionist or they they don't want to tell them what their symptoms are. But it's about knowing what you need to say to get that appointment, and I do think that is an issue as well. Um, thanks, Caroline. I think that's probably an appropriate point to move on to the um, GPs. So we're joined in the um, chamber um, by Dr. Rashama Shah and Jessica. Loosely, who's the PCN um, facilitator, and Dr. Shah is a local um, GP, and I think chairs one of the PCNs currently. If I got that right, a chair one of the PCNs, sitting sitting actually. Um, so um, thank you very much for your um, the three papers you've um, produced. The terms of reference, um, the some data broken down by the um, different neighbourhood or PCN level, and then um, some helpful. Um, uh, graphs and maps. I suppose one of the areas I'm sure you're going to touch on is the, why, the I suppose why we see such disparity between certain practices and or areas. And if you if you can assist us there, but over to you. Thank you. That one. Sorry. Hi. Uh, yes, yeah, I'm one of the GPs in City and Hackney. Um, 
I, and I always feel very bad when I hear patients struggle to get appointments because I think it's a it's a big barrier for patients. It's scary enough to talk about cancer and then it's another barrier to get through. But I agree, I think patient information and knowing what to say to your GP because all GPs will have emergency lists, duty doctor, you know, all GPs, if they think a patient's worried about cancer, will always kind of squeeze them in. I guess really when we're talking about breast cancer, we're talking about two different things. One is the screening service and the other thing is symptomatic patients. And really in primary care, you know, you can do public health on an individual level when you see the patient one-to-one -one and tell them and teach them about breast cancer being breast aware. But really, mainly the patients that I would see would be patients with lumps or with symptoms, you know, who would, you know, then need a referral to secondary care. When it comes to screening, um, it's, you know, everyone's talked about it already. It's a very kind of outdated paper-based system. So we get letters, we code them if, if patients have had a mammogram or not have a, not had a mammogram. What's different about the mammograms compared to, you know, cervical screening and bowel cancer screening is that you don't get um, kind of alerts on the GP system. So I could see a patient who's 60 and actually it would not be very easy for me to get their history if they've had a mammogram or not had a mammogram and you know if you if you know that information quickly you can do opportunistic you know public health say look you haven't had your mammogram let's have a quick chat go go for it and you know empower patients like that so i think by having more data for gps it you know it could be on an individual basis helpful um i think also a lot of patients will say that it's very it's not that convenient the three sites that you can get breast cancer screening there's only three spots at the moment and they're mainly kind of close to stratford or in i think kentish town but when we you know i always direct our patients to go to the receptionist who will usually support patients to rebook and it's a it's a it's 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 not always that kind of the, the process isn't always that easy so i think maybe we could think about that um and yeah, I, I agree. There's this whole thing about data and ethnicity. It's that there is a kind of data hole, but I, there are lots of pushes for you know GPs to code things like ethnicity. So maybe in the next year or so, we'll get some more clarity about that. Just looking back at the kind of individual practices, you know, by performance, you know, the bottom five performing data in the northeast London, you know, page thirty-two. It, it's it's the Stamford Hill GP practices and so you know I think we if we're going to do work we need to think about that population carefully and what their needs are um, and uh, and it has to be you know tailored approach yeah got sorry yes uh, uh, helpful um a uh, breakdown of hackney it just in terms of sort of that point is it is it just say stamford hill well if we, if we if say we look here at the well street common pcn group with only an eight or say i mean an 8.7 uptake compare that to say um hackney marsh is at 44.9 so that oh. not being stamford hill no. hackney marsh is actually having quite a a uh, bespoke demographic population that in, in many metrics is actually um, very deprived. W what's going on there? Is that I think is this that is not coding? Co I think this is coding. I'd I'd be very surprised for Well Street Common for 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 it to be so low. Yeah, go on. I'm gonna. So Jess works with all the GP practices at an individual level, so actually knows a bit more. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, so I'm the PCN Cancer Facilitator and I am speaking to the practices. This week we've just had an update on this keg data. So Well Street Common has gone from 8.8 to 17% just by pulling out different codes. So we, are, we have started a piece of work on looking at what codes are being used by the practices and what codes we're pulling to try and make this a bit more accurate. So all of them have gone up. I broke them down before I came, but they've all gone up at least to 2 to 5%. Well Street Common's doubled. So there's definitely lots of work we can do around coding. So that's what I'm doing at the moment to see what practices are doing in-house. 
if they're even receiving the results because some aren't getting those letters they're not they haven't got access to any of that information so it's not being put on the system so we can't see it so there's lots of work going around with that and then how we can support the practices do they need someone to come in and do some of that coding for them so our data is more useful um well i wrote i think that was it really should i have a look and yeah a more education around the importance of when they do come to a gp with signs and symptoms that they're worried about how important it is that they go for that urgent cancer referral appointment um because we have lots of people that often miss them or don't come in so patient education around the importance of being available for the next two weeks so you can access that appointment um and the information text to them or given to them emailed to them however they need it in whichever language um, up to date so we work with the cancer alliance on that as well i think that's for me so yeah i work with the cancer alliance and community links a bit of a funny role but yeah that's me <laughs> thank Thanks. you and did you have anything else dr Shah? was that, that, that was the, um any any questions councillor turbo oh, thank, thank you chair thank you so much um just very briefly um we have eight percent take up in well street common area just following up on data that's that's an area i'm council of as well is there any information as to why and then very quickly and secondly um just curious about whether there is incentive as well for gps in terms of uptake just to understand that a little bit thank you it was a question about incentive for screening yeah we it's we, we there's no uh, there's no um sorry what's your i mean i have read about uh how in the past uh, gps have been in a lot of pressure to provide um more support for making sure that uptake of a screening increase but that means extra work on the gp surgery because of course funding is very limited so is there also a sort of incent economic incentive being also tied up to that or as a barrier yeah. sorry i didn't explain yeah, no, before sorry, no. there's no incentive for improving uptake for breast cancer um in in, in primary care there are small um pushes called early cancer diagnosis which are kind of small commissioned kind of projects but that's not always about breast cancer you know each pcm will pick a different cancer that they want to focus on and i think a lot this year are focusing on bowel cancer but there is always a push to improve early cancer diagnosis and you usually pick one kind of cancer to put your efforts in rather than all of them and do you have did you have another question uh, Councillor adams Thank you, Chair. My, my question is around the campaign uh, for the uh, screen uptake for the hard to reach group. How often does that campaign take place? Um, that would be more towards the Cancer Alliance, I think, and um, Caroline. Caroline, the uh, campaign for the hard to reach um, groups, how often does that campaign take place? <laughs> so at the moment, they tend to run at least two or three times a year we don't want to overload people because there's lots of screening awareness months and so or cancer awareness months so we always run some we'd always run them through october and probably in about april may time as well divide it up through the year usually for about four weeks thank you caroline i'm, I'm now going to um move on to secondary care and so I'm very grateful for uh, Dr. Hortsford, who's joining us um, in the chamber, and also Mary Flatley from Homerton. Um, there's members of a separate presentation with respect to this. Um, and I think one, one of the areas just looking through um, for you both was the, the change of the targets from 10 down to 3 and what impact you think that's a good move or a bad move and what impact you may think that may have. Um, hello, thank you for having us here. I'm Mary Flatley and I'm here with my colleague Catherine Hawksford, who's consultant oncologist from Barts. Um, I'll come on to your question in a second if that's all right. But I just wanted to start by saying at Homerton, um, what we do is diagnose and provide surgical treatments and follow-up care to people diagnosed with breast cancer. 
but we work very closely with Bart's Health, um, where the medical and clinical oncology team provide all the actual anti-cancer treatments and radiotherapy and other appropriate treatments for patients. There's a joint multidisciplinary meeting where all patients are discussed and a plan of care is decided and agreed. Um, I've put in the appendix the, the kind of treatments that are available um, and some explanation about all of those. Um, so patients we see are mainly referred by their GP on urgent two-week wait um, pathway and um, patients who undergo screening are found to have breast cancer are referred usually directly to BARTS. I did get some data actually for the year April 22 to March 23 and we received 4,509 referrals on a two-week wait pathway um, and of these referrals, 4,378 did not have cancer. Um, I think we missed a trick with those people because I think it's a time when people are very um, affected by the fear of having cancer and it is what might be called a teachable moment where you might be able to influence people's health behaviours and we don't really do that and I think we really missed something there. So. Um, in that year, 131 people were diagnosed with breast cancer, 129 women and two men. We do have very few men. Um, I put in a table about age. I think the mean um, age of patients is 56. Um, so it shows that we are seeing people of a slightly younger population. And also, I put in um, a table on ethnicity. I think we worked out, I worked out, it was 29% people from um, uh, black uh, ethnicities of different kinds, 9% um, Asian and 53% white with some others. Um, and I think really um, I went on just to describe the pathway because the path we see people in a one-stop clinic where we assess them, they have their tests, they have, might have a biopsy, they then come back for the results of the tests and then are told whether or not they have cancer. Um, and um, they're then moved on for their treatment after a discussion at MDT. And I think it, it's very clear in there. So just talking about referrals, um, so the two-week wait standard, we were actually um, uh, addressing it. We were for the quarters one to four, we met the standard in two occasions and we're just below it on two occasions. And uh, some of that was around um, uh, capacity of clinics, I think, that was a problem. But um, we're actually going to carry on using the two way weight standard because Although we have been measuring the FDS, the faster diagnostic standard, which is a standard where you learn whether you have or have not cancer within 28 days. Um, we've been actually measuring that for a year and achieving it quite well. Although more recently we haven't, um, but some of that was due to the strikes and the capacity because reduced capacity in the strikes. So I think we feel quite confident that we're not going to um, you know, reduce that by the change in standards. Um, but we will be keeping an internal measurement of that too, we away anyway. Um, and I think I went on to describe some of the support services and some of the issues that we have um, in terms of trying to support and and give psychological support to our patients. But I'll hand over to Catherine if you have some thoughts about um, our, our client group or our patient group. Hi, thanks, Mary. So, yeah, my name's uh, Dr. Catherine Hawkson. I'm one of the medical oncology consultants. I work across Bart's Health and Mahometan. Um, and a lot of what we've talked about is very, very relevant in terms of trying to increase screening and ultimately that's all about earlier diagnosis. And really for me as an oncologist, I'm 
on the far end of giving cancer treatment and earlier diagnosis is absolutely key, both in an early breast cancer setting in terms of increasing survival, but also um, even those patients that are presenting with uh, later stages of cancer, if they can present earlier, we can really make a difference to them in terms of the anti-cancer therapy that we can deliver. Looking at our population here in particular, um, there is a lot of discussion about there being a slightly younger population. We know that these younger populations can have more aggressive breast cancers. In particular, we think about something like triple negative breast cancer, which is more prevalent in a younger population, in patients in populations that carry um, gene mutations, and in black and other um, ethnic groups. And so they are more aggressive breast cancers. They have a much worse survival. And catching them early is absolutely fundamental in terms of being able to improve the survival of these patients. And so, yeah, screening is obviously really important and there's clear areas to help with that. But actually, it's, it's wider than that because we're looking at younger populations as well, which would fall out of this screening bracket. So we can't solely focus there. It's very important that we think about that population under 50, of which we see a lot, and how we can target them, how we can increase their breast awareness and get them coming in through the doors earlier. On the other side of that, the other part of my work is I work in our follow-up clinic. So I look after these women and look at their long-term follow-up and their effects after their cancer treatment, how these women are going to then get back into life, get back to work, work with their families, grow their families or not. And we look at all of the survivorship issues. And that's a real key area that we need to focus on as well because we are seeing younger women we are thankfully curing more women with breast cancer as well and therefore we're growing a population of women that, and men that have to live with the lasting effects of having a cancer diagnosis and the treatments and their toxicities that we give them many of which can be long term so there's kind of two ends of the spectrum really just in terms of the, the the first point you're making about having a younger population, and I mean, presumably there might be a, a, a sort of a cost argument made that it wouldn't be sensible to, or cost proportionate to, lower the age of screening. I think we're possibly waiting for studies to come out. But then, if that if that were to be the case, what sort of practical suggestions are there to try and increase breast awareness for the younger cohort? So I think. Lowering, obviously, with that data needs to come out. There are much younger women who present with breast cancer that even through screening, it's not going to help because of things like breast density. So on a practical nature, you may not necessarily pick it up, no matter how young you set your screening age. And so it's actually things like um, my colleague mentioned about having these moments with it that you can try and have a teachable moment with patients. So taking on other elements when they're presenting through to healthcare that you can really seize upon trying to give them some breast awareness education at the same time. You know, whether that be through reviews for cervical screening, for example, or whether it's through other health asthma checks, diabetes checks, these things that are happening regularly, whether there are times that we can give some kind of breast awareness alongside that. The point that Mary made as well is that we've got huge numbers of women being referred through that don't have breast cancer, but they're obviously presenting themselves with some kind of concern, and therefore that's a big population that we could impact in terms of empowering them with more health information. Um, members? Um, Mary, I was going to ask, in terms of the the, 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 sort of the large number that come through um, by way of referrals, is that because the initial screening mammogram isn't always accurate, or is a lot of those through GP referrals where they haven't gone through the, the screening mm -hmm. service? No, all of our patients are through the GP. So somebody will go to the a woman will go to the GP with some concern. There might be a lump, and it turns out to be not, you know, not cancer. Um, but we will investigate it. So it's, um, you know, I think 
of those two-week wait numbers, it's about 93% are not cancer. So, it, you know, we are seeing a lot of people for investigation that turn out not to have it. Um, uh, Councillor Terpstenhoff. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, we, um, we learned from a previous commission uh, when we were discussing um, dentistry, uh, the part of uh, routine checks for oral cancer uh, took place without even the patient perhaps even knowing. That was just a standard. The dentist will do very quickly every time you go and attend and you visit your dentist. Could there be something like that for breast uh, cancer screening? Uh, when, when we women, say for example, especially now with the younger women, that when we visit the, our GPs, that maybe a question is asked about whether we have any symptoms or if we notice anything different. Basically, as it happens with mouth cancer, that is a bit of a routine. Would that ever be, could that be an option, perhaps? Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Did, Jessica, did you want to? Um, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's a good idea and it's kind of a teachable moment to empower women when they're coming in for something else. The only thing that we have to think about is the, pop pop the population who are coming in to see their GP for other health needs are a kind of engaged population already. And we have to think about women and men who aren't presenting to the GP, who aren't speaking, who English isn't their first language, who, you know, actually may need more investment in for them to really understand what they need to come to see their doctor and appropriately seek health care for. Yeah. And Jessica, did you have anything to add? Thank you. Only very quickly. So I'm also a practice nurse by background, and I know when we do the cervical screening, um, one of the things that we're trained to do within that 15 minutes with the patient is say, do you check your breasts? How do you check them? Do you know what to look out for changes and what to do? So it is sort of built into that often as well, a bit like the dentist example. Yeah. Um, thank you. I'm going to now move on to our final presentation um, from Copperfield. So welcome Helen Farrant and Emma Walker, who's the head of service and head of information um manager so um helen is it, is it you um starting off for emma oh that would be me yes thank you uh good evening yes i would like to begin by thanking the chair for inviting us to the meeting and providing us with the opportunity to share our mission and the work we've been doing to ensure that breast cancers in younger people are diagnosed as early as possible as part of your broader discussion on the topic um so i will be talking around um what we have shared in the presentation so this does follow on um, some, some background on us, Copperfield was founded in 2009 by Chris Halenga and her twin sister Maren. Chris was diagnosed with secondary breast cancer at the age of 23. She had visited three GPs with symptoms of breast cancer before she was finally referred and diagnosed with secondary breast cancer. At the time, Chris was unaware that breast cancer could affect people in their 20s and she knew very little about the disease. Her incurable diagnosis could have been prevented had her cancer been detected earlier. This realisation led her to start Copperfield, an organisation focused on educating young people about breast cancer and encouraging them to take charge of their own health. This was the beginning of our chest checking mission. So as we have discussed already, Breast cancer is the most common cancer in the UK and one in seven women in the UK will be diagnosed with the disease in their lifetime. While it is most commonly diagnosed in women over 50, breast cancer can happen to people of all ages and ethnicities and is in fact the most common cancer in adult females between the ages of 15 and 44. Additionally, con contrary to popular belief, uh, as we've mentioned as well, 400 men are also diagnosed with the disease every year. There's also health inequalities evident in breast cancer data and our founder Chris's story is sadly one that is reflected in the stats with young people. They're more likely to be diagnosed with the disease at a later stage to their counterparts over the age of 50. 
This is due to various factors, including the National Screening Programme, which is offered to women over 50 and has helped to get thousands of women diagnosed earlier than they would have done otherwise, and in many instances before they are symptomatic. Under 50s do not qualify for screening, so they are most typically diagnosed only after experiencing signs and symptoms of breast cancer. To ensure that all breast cancers are diagnosed early, it, it is crucial for people of all ages to know the signs and symptoms of breast cancer and practice breast awareness, which is the term used by the NHS. This is particularly important for young people at pre-screening ages. However, our research indicates that many young people do not believe that breast cancer is relevant to their age and consequently the majority of them do not check their chests on a regular basis. Moreover, additional health inequalities persist with younger women, black women and pregnant women being more likely to be diagnosed at later stages. Later stage diagnosis makes treatment more challenging and results in a poorer prognosis. When diagnosed at stage four, the stage at which Chris was diagnosed, breast cancer is treatable but incurable. Consequently, despite being rarer in younger people, once diagnosed with breast cancer, younger people have poorer outcomes, which is reflected in the fact that breast cancer is sadly one of the leading causes of death in women under 40. So what are we doing about this? Our mission is to ensure that all breast cancers in younger people are diagnosed early and correctly. And we endeavor to achieve this by focusing on educating young people about the signs and symptoms of breast cancer and the importance of regular chest checking. We want them to get to know their own normal and to have confidence in visiting the GP if they notice any changes. We utilise a range of mediums to communicate this message to young people, including our one-stop shop web app called The Self-Checkout, which guides users through the process of checking your chest. Since its relaunch in September this year, The Self-Checkout has had 107,000 unique users. We also take our message to schools, providing downloadable PSHE Association accredited lesson plans, free physical and downloadable materials and resources and with the help of our student ambassadors our message reaches campuses and universities across the country. Our Boo Bets volunteer their time to share their personal experiences with breast cancer and inspire others to get to know their bodies. They visit workplaces, schools, youth groups and more. Additionally we understand the crucial role of healthcare professionals in early breast cancer diagnosis and are here to support them with webinars and resources. We also conduct social media and marketing campaigns and recent campaigns have included an advert aired during the ad break of ITV's Love Island. Last month we had a branded photo booth stationed in Shoreditch Bo Box Park offering passers-by free photos after watching our checking video and learning more about the signs and symptoms of breast cancer and the importance of checking. On top of all this, we offer a free monthly text reminder service. We have 2,500 educators on our mailing list, over 2,800 healthcare professionals engaged in our networks, and we remind over 125,000 people to check every month via the text messages. We think raising awareness of breast cancer in younger people and getting young people checking is really important. And there's reasons why. Why is raising awareness of breast cancer in younger people so important in Hackney? Hackney is a relatively young borough with 25% of its population under 20 and another 23% aged between 20 to 29 years old. This demographic makeup is not expected to change significantly between now and 2041. National priorities include the goal that by 2028, 75% of cancers will be diagnosed at stage one or two, resulting in 55,000 more people surviving for more than five years after diagnosis. Also, the Women's Health Strategy for England in 2022 lists breast awareness as part of their 10-year ambitions. It's crucial to note that black women are typically diagnosed with breast cancer at a much younger age than white women, 
48 versus 60, which is significant given that national screening starts at 50. Members of the Ash Ashkenazi Jewish community are also more likely to be diagnosed with breast cancer at an earlier age due to the prevalence of the BRCA gene within their community. These disparities are particularly pertinent for Hackney's diverse community of black women, South Asian women and Ashkenazi Jewish women. We're eager to hear what local NHS partners in Hackney and the North East London Cancer Alliance more broadly are already doing to ensure early diagnosis of breast cancer in younger people and to explore potential collaboration. We're keen to work with partners on public awareness campaigns, getting our PSHE pack taught in local schools and disseminating our free resources via the HPV vaccination programme. Thank you for your time and attention. Um, thank you very much, Emma. Um, can I just pick up on a couple of points from Emma's presentation? Um, the, the Ashkenazi um, population, maybe Jane, directed to you, um, where there's a higher prevalence because of gene type. Um, what is, is there a local public health or system response to that, to um, encourage more testing, or encourage more screening, sorry? Is, is there a plan in place with respect to that that we're aware of? Um, so I think, I don't know whether uh, I can answer that question because I think this is, like I said, the work, the, the sort of like screening and awareness raising of all of these programmes is led through um, the NHS more. I mean, we can highlight the data. I don't think we have data on specifically the Ashkenazi Jewish population. Obviously, we have a large Haredi Jewish population in the north of the borough. And I think that Caroline did mention um, some targeted work uh, promoting breast screening, at least not so. I don't know whether that covered breast awareness. Um, I, I'm not I can't remember. I'll have to have an, another look at the slides. But they, I think some, that was mentioned as a, a targeted campaign for that community, as I understand it. Was it Caroline who mentioned it? I'm not sure. Sorry. Well, did you put up your hand briefly there as well? I, yeah, so there is a plan oh, um, okay. with regard to the um, Jewish Ashkenazi population. So um, all women um, are going to be offered a screening in relation to this. So that's going to happen locally. It's going to be supported by our um, local um, setup of local services where they will see a breast care nurse who will go through their history. They will be referred through to genetics for screening um, because we know, I think statistically, um, one in 40 um, of that population will actually carry the BRCA gene. So this is about to be rolled out um, in January, February of next year. The local cancer alliances and Caroline and Femi can jump in, um, have supported with some of the funding to get these clinics set up and um, managing the initial phase um, with regard to this population screening. They will then, once they've had their genetic screening, come into the high risk screening program and they will have their annual high-risk screening managed within the National High-Risk Screening Programme if they are then um, diagnosed as carrying the BRCA gene mutation. So it's, it's about to be rolled out and our screening population um, of Ashkenazi Jews, I think we've got the biggest in the London area. So it, with the, national, the annual screening will come in through our service once the genetic um, testing has taken place for this population but it's rolling out January, February, um, 2024. Thank you, Claire. And so that, that is not just over 50s, that is across the no, whole. No, that's, that's across the whole, the whole um, Ashkenazi Jewish female population. Going back to Councillor Kenny's question about sort of flexibility then. So the reason why you're able to do that is did, almost, did you need to get, presumably you need to get the funding in place. Did you also need to get permission to go outside the nice guy or whether it be the, the national guidelines or what or once you got funding could you just do it what were what the constraints are you from acting more nimbly if i put it that way in terms of when you see an evidence base yeah so obviously funding because it isn't just about doing the initial assessment you've got to have mri capacity that's all got to be built in to the current systems which we know are already quite stretched um but this is happening on a on a national level as well as a, a pan london level is my understanding but the alliances have supported with the initial funding and getting the staff on the ground floor to um have these clinics up and running as soon as possible 
Thank, thank you. And just on another point that Emma picked up on in terms of um, GP training, I mean, is there a case there in terms of sort of the, the um, uh, stories about misdiagnosis? Is I mean, how regularly are is it part of the GP training program in terms of uh, giving them the best? Um, information so so they're aware or is that a common thing i mean i suppose mary's stats in terms of over <laughs> over referral would in, indicate there's a great degree of cautious cautiousness yeah so in gp training it's three years and you'd have a weekly session which is a kind of 20 people with external speakers coming to give you talks over lots of different topics including early cancer and screening and diagnosis and then you'd have a tutor one-on-one -on -one just to kind of you know boost your learning um both you know and and that is and that has to keep evolving to keep up to date with all the kind of latest evidence and empowering patients for screening as well um can i just say two things one of the things that you know picked up on the last talk, which is an actual problem that lots of GPs would face, is that the, the referral for, you know, the cancer two-week weight pathways starts at age 18. And it's really tricky if you've got someone who's younger to actually make a, you know, do a, a, a referral in a kind of easy way. You have to often escalate it to a kind of pediatrician on call, um, or you'd have you'd have to find different routes, but that are not set the way that you know an adult with a lump might present to the GP. Um, and I forgot the other thing I was going to say. And, and, and um, Jane, in terms of um, you know education awareness and sort of Copperfield's points about more education in schools, I mean, is, is there a role for public health there to try and facilitate? I know, I know it can be hard the number of academies and different management structures across the school estate in Hackney, but it, it, is there a possible role there to facilitate greater education at um, secondary school level? I mean, yeah, potentially I would, yes, I think so. Did, did Emma, did you mention that you did work in schools already and are you working in Hackney schools? We we do. Um, we'd, we'd obviously love for it to be um, much more streamlined. So if we could look at kind of, um, that's why we particularly suggest things like the HPV vaccination programme. So we're um, in contact with Vaccination UK who have the contract in Hackney and we'll, we'll be delivering, delivering that vaccination in the summer term next year. So that's an ideal, again, kind of building on that teachable moment that we said with adults I think there's definitely scope to um, embed some um, wider cancer awareness messaging at that point in time but obviously particularly with cervical cancer but looking at um, you know our offering in terms of free resources or an information sheet that accompanies that um, person's information when they're receiving the vaccination but we yes we do have um, the school packs as well but again if they could be rolled out on a kind of much wider and streamlined level that would be fantastic um thank you and, and caroline i see your hands up there your race yeah so um just on, on the point around working in school so we've had a project that we ran last year which was um to offer well to work with schools because it's part of the phse now is that they should be getting cancer awareness training so um or lessons so we've um, we've worked with schools in redbridge last year to do that with um, year 10s and 11s and that went down really well so the the feedback that we got from the evaluation i think they saw over two they spoke to over two thousand children um and the feedback we got was that about not over 90 percent of the pupils that were involved actually said that they had increased awareness they were more likely to speak to their families about it and they understood the the need to check themselves so that was girls with their breasts and, and boys with their um with their testicles so it was um really really good so we're, we're working on that again this year unfortunately not in hackney at the moment but in tower hamlets and newham um but the idea is this year we're trying to develop something that's sustainable so we can roll it out across the whole of North East london but in a way that's not going to like so we don't have to keep funding it so it's like train the trainer and also some um some online work as well so hopefully that will that will have an impact um one other point i want to put that we've also 
funded a, a, a charity called ACS, which is a Jewish charity that works with the Haredi population. So we funded them to do some awareness work as well. And um, and they'll be holding sessions with um, with women to talk particularly about um, like the um, like genetics and 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 breast screening and, and well all cancers, but breast screening will definitely be in there. Um, thank you, Caroline. And it, 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 it is—I don't know whether um, Femi from an alliance point or Claire from a screening point. The, the sense that the screening program is not coterminous with the ICS footprints does that in itself present challenges, or is that is that not much of an issue? I think because historically that's how it's been. We really haven't known any different. So I presume from a data perspective it makes things more complicated but from day to day in relation to running of the service um it, it's kind of how it's always been we've never been aligned with the icbs unlike bowel and cervical i don't know caroline if you want to jump in or femi yeah from my point of view i've since i've worked in this area it's i haven't known any different I mean, you could argue that having two different screening services, you're getting two different services for different people across the, you know, different levels of service, but I mean, across the um, North East London. But um, I think you're right, probably from the data point of view, because the way we receive data is, if we, is usually by ICB, but actually the screening services don't work like that. Um. Thank you. Um, are there any final, we're, we're almost coming to time. I do, uh, Councillor, before? I think I'm very a bit naive in when it comes to these cancer issues. But what I would like to know is, um, is there any age limit one can uh, become attracted to cancer uh, thingy? And if yes, um, can, that be, um, can there be a new system in place to examine them before uh, from that end to go in so that they will reduce in terms of the numbers escalating when they get to the adult age. Emma, did you want to come in there? Um, just to reiterate the point around that's why we exist to raise awareness of breast cancer in young people, that they're not necessarily going to have breast cancer at that age, but by building that checking habit, that um, you know that healthy behaviour around their own body and awareness, they can then um, understand any changes that may appear later in life and take the next steps by seeing a healthcare professional. So I think it's you know important to note that um, yes, it is obviously it is affecting young people, um, but that's we are part of the bigger picture really. That if there's a you know solid awareness raising in younger people. Um, hopefully that will take them through, you know, life, later life when perhaps their likelihood of actually having breast cancer and their risk has increased. They will know what to, what to do and how to access the relevant healthcare pathways. So there's lots we can be doing and um, piloting in, in Hackney, I think, around breast awareness, particularly with such a young population. Um, thank you. Um, just before I bring this item to close, can I just get clear in my own mind, just in terms of any sort of suggestions or recommendations that we may uh, uh, make? Um, with, it, it is the, the the reason why we're in this quite convoluted um, system where the GPs have to do all the coding for who turns up or who doesn't for the screening? Is, is there a new? Is there a commissioning round? that's coming up where this may change councillor kennedy uh, this this isn't on this specific point but i did want to do a sort of like wider council response especially to um emma and really thank her for her input and at times when local authorities are absolutely strapped for cash as we are at the moment um, and health systems are strapped for cash to hear from um a voluntary community third sector organizations that are really wanting to work um, with us we should be welcoming it with absolute open arms yeah. and there are all sorts of opportunities 
with our community champions work in public health. Um, the, just the comms that we possess as a council, we're always pumping out comms. Uh, there will be times where I think we should be carrying uh, Copperfield's message because that's the way you get the kind of prevention that Dr. Hawksford was talking about at an earlier um, stage. Uh, with the schools awareness and Young Hackney and the, the PHSE work that they do, there's, there's a whole raft of opportunity for us here to um, actually do what the I in ICS stands for and integrate between those, the anchor institutions and the community and the voluntary and third sector. Absolutely. Um, um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of thinking that there are certain things come coming out of here in terms of um, coordinating with schools, coordinating more with the council, possibly um, the, the, the under 18 pathway and supporting any clarity and um, requests for data. But the the is the contra is a say the screening system up for contractual or commissioning renewal at which point NHS London might then revisit the um, process by which it's all done. Do we do we know is there is there a date when, when that's coming up or is this is is the current system just going on um, with no with no stop date? Does anybody know um, what the commissioning framework is? No. <laughs> okay. um, so, so, I was going to say, I mean, we, what we do know for breast screening is that the current contract is placed in place is coming to an end. Um, and I believe by 2025, um, so, I, so I don't think the whole entire structure is changing, um, but I know that the there is there is opportunities um, for other provide for providers to bid for that service in 2025 is what I believe. It, it, it just hearing it, it does see. I think we have identified it. But it does seem the fact that, that this can't be like other screening programs, where the, the people undertaking the screening can input the data and then that be made available to everybody in a quite streamlined way and to public health just seems madness. And that in any reformulated system, whether this needs to sort of be um, the extent to which this is raised at sort of the national select committee or the, you know elsewhere to, to raise awareness on this. So, uh, Sandra? Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, Chair, I was actually going to make a suggestion that perhaps there are some um, issues that could be raised um, nationally through political channels, like through select committees, about um, how how it makes it difficult at the local and ICB level to most effectively engage with with um, uh, people and um, particularly around reducing inequalities when you don't really have a good understanding because the because of the way the data are, are presented and and shared and and mostly because they're not shared um, and um, but also to make some suggestions um, that could and that could go through the NHS route about how much how it would be helpful to share the data in a different way. I mean, even our first um, presentation from the um, Cancer Alliance was really helpful, but actually also really unhelpful in one sense because they don't have the demographic data to help you get the breakdown, and that can't be helpful for them either. So there are probably some things that the NHS could do differently um, when they recommission it. But there are some things that um, are more more an issue of national policy um, that may be worth bringing up to a select committee. But there are um, there's there's an evidence base around screening more generally, and of course there's going to be an evidence base related to um, breast cancer screening, and some of that will be about the health economics of it, and not just whether any one individual person would benefit from screening because it's such actually a population level intervention. Um, so it's probably not very likely that they're just going to um, massively increase the age range um, for screening, but there are probably some ways that um, the programme could be adjusted that would make it much easier at local level to interact with it, both as a patient, but also from our, our, our point of view as public health and providers. and um, and therefore make it increase its effectiveness uh, as you know the uptake and the effectiveness of it overall 
Thank you, Sandra. Um, so I'm going to what I'm going to do. I see Councillor Carr. I'm going to bring this item to a close. I think just I'll, I'll bring in Councillor Conway um, uh, briefly just before we close it off. But I think certainly um, it's something for us to consider possibly raising it, possibly with um, the MP Meg, who's um, certainly raised other issues um, on our half before with some success, um, but also possibly just making the point to the, the National Select Committee um, that there is this disjunct with the data so that that that's something we can follow up on i think also on a, on a local level we can make sort of recommendations that i've already alluded to in integration with the council and, and the school estate um councillor conway and then i'll um bring the oh, sorry, you're not here as a councillor Sophie conway um and then i'll bring the items to a close thank you very much chair and um, i just wanted to start by saying um thank you councillor kennedy for your for your offer i'm sure that copperfield who i'm here representing um this evening very much like to take you up on that offer but also I, i'd really love to have a conversation with our colleagues from um, the northeast london cancer alliance whose reach expands of course beyond um just that of hackney because it, it feels as though that we would be sort of ripe for, for some some partnership there i just think just to leave us on this point of just recognizing that unlike nationally breast cancer is the leading cause of death in women under the age of 50 and it's really important that while this meeting has been primarily focused on screening that we do remember that actually um, of the people who are diagnosed with breast cancer in Hackney um, each year, 43% of them are under the age of 50. So the two things have to be looked at side by side and, and we need to ensure that the same sort of concerted effort that we're um, aiming to have in relation to screening can be replicated in relation to um, breast awareness. So I'm really looking forward to um, picking these points up with partners beyond this meeting. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, I'm not, I'm not, I'm over time and I'm trying to, I, I, sorry, I, I'm over time. So I think, I think we, we, I hope, I think lots of questions have been asked by all council. I am going to, I am going to um, uh, close it now because we're 10 minutes over on this item. But um, can I thank all, every, all the collaborators and everyone that's presented here has been um, very helpful and certainly hopefully, um, I hope you, you've all found it helpful and there's possibly some things, actions we can take forward as well. So thank you. Um, everyone who came for this item, please don't feel the uh, need to stay. Uh, we've got one, one other item uh, unrelated uh, moving on. So I'm now going to move on to the um, second substantive item on the agenda, which is in relation to um, the uh, City and Hackney Place-Based Partnership and the staffing structure. Uh, I'm, we're joined by uh, Amy in the chamber. I'm welcome. We're joined by Louise Ashley um, online. Thank you, uh, Louise, for attending. And Dr. Cochrane has given her apologies. Um, I don't know, Louise, if you were planning on just doing a brief instruction before Amy. Thank you for um, providing sort of the new staff structure. Um, Louise, did you want to give it an intro before we go to Amy? Yeah, thank, thanks for that, Councillor Hayes. Yes, I think um, we've, we've talked a lot about this and the kind of, um, we are talking in the Partnership Board and the Neighbourhood Board about how we kind of, I guess, protect the resource that we have for City and Hackney because, um, you know, as we regularly hear, there's a lot of good work going on and we need to, we need to protect that. And I think we all worry slightly about the fact that we um the sort of monies for the the structure that's that you've been sent sit very much with the icb and with the current financial difficulties being so and the finance being so volatile uh that kind of worries us however um amy and myself and baz and many of us have been sort of lobbying and um, very much on it uh, as far as um, making sure that resource isn't just kind of being suddenly removed or anything like that uh, and we are having discussions about um, perhaps how we can better secure the kind of resources for city and hackney and and whether the partnership looks um, at different ways of uh, bringing these posts sort of financially closer to City and Hackney rather than sitting in the ICB. But those are just um, discussions at, at the moment. Um, and Amy has been doing a lot of work with the um, team at the ICB around sort of securing this structure. And thank you very much, Amy, for putting all this together. So I'm going to hand over to Amy just to go through the structure and uh, the kind of 
I guess the assurance that we have that uh, this is kind of working for us at the moment in City and Hackney. Thank you. Amy, is there? It is. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of all the seats in the chamber, <laughs> I thought I'd sat on the one that had no microphone. <laughs> um, thank you very much. That's really helpful. Um, so, as Louise says, um, it's a, a, a bit of a moving feast in terms of the development of the place based partnership. We have, and I say we in the, the very loosest possible sense, um, the partnership have been working. Um, to consolidate what we have at City and Hackney. We're very proud of our integrated history. We're proud of the strong partnerships that we have and, um, and mostly of the outcomes that we've been able to achieve together. And we, we have a lot to protect, I think. So um, the wider context around the development of the ICB um, continues. Um, the, there are financial pressures. Um, these are coming thick and fast in terms of the staffing, but also in terms of the clinical leadership. And I will touch on that in a moment um, on behalf of Steph, who, who isn't here. Um, I think the, it's important to say that at ICB level, there is uh, still a narrative around how important place is and that there's a lot of work that needs to be done at place. Um, the flip side of that is that we don't know um, what an allocation at place might look like and if indeed it does look like it will come. Um, so, so watch the space there, I think. Um, another, another of the key risks I just mentioned around clinical leadership and if Steph were here she would expand on this a little bit but um, we have also had a strong history of clinical leadership in City and Hackney, as you'll know, and um, Steph has done a lot of work to try and secure this. Uh, recently, we've been asked for a considerable reduction, so a 30% reduction in our um, capacity for clinical leadership. This is on the back of a 20% reduction um, at the beginning of 2023, so overall 50% reduction on what we had been functioning at previously. Um, so that goes, it's a reduction of around about seven and a half sessions worth a week going forward. Um, we are proposing a core ICB funded um, cadre, if you like, of clinical leaders and looking to seek some additional non-recurrent funding to, to bridge the next year or so for the posts that we want to retain at a city and Hackney priorities, but we work on that outside. Um, so I think the, the obviously link there is the outcomes and, and that's the thing that we're particularly worried about in terms of our management and the way that we manage um, clinically um, and in this triumvirate model. The, I don't know if you want to have a little break there and move on to the staffing or whether we want to go. If I could just, just to understand, so the clinical, yeah. the clinical positions that we've lost or at risk of losing, what, what does that look? I mean, from, from our mm. point of view, I mean, we've always seen say, Richard Bull coming as like leading primary care and you know we have that anchor person mm. um, there and I said so, so what does it look like who, who are we losing in crew terms on, mm. on the clinical leadership side okay so um, so Richard's not clinical um, when we talk about clinical leadership we uh, talk about clinical and care professionals who are uh, clinically qualified so all of our GPs, uh, Steph, for example, um, all, all of those people who input to our, our leadership and our management. Um, Richard is a, a very amazing primary care commissioner. And so the, um, the commissioning structure is what you've got here. And we can have a look at that in a bit more detail as well. Sorry, sorry my mistake for confusing matters. So then on the clinical side, would, would we say be talking, say, then about, in crude terms, about a reduction of the allocation Dr. Cochrane Steph would have to be able to give to a leadership role in sort of crew terms, or would there be other people in sort of mental health leads? Or mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, that's an excellent question. So the um, the funding for clinical leadership is currently at NAL ICB. Um, there are not conversations at this point about the potential devolution of that to place, although that would be. Um, something that would be considered, I think, in terms of outcomes um, to be quite groundbreaking. So um, I think there could be further conversations about that. But yes, to, to answer your question, it's a reduction of 50% capacity on, um, on that clinical input across the board and all of the programmes. I think Louise has got a hand up. Louise? 
Yeah, I guess, um, I suppose just, thanks Amy, I suppose just to clarify a bit more the clinical leadership stuff. So this is um, leadership of um, programmes across the partnership, as opposed to reducing clinical leaders that are providing clinical care. Does that make sense? So this is about clinician, the, the time that they have to facilitate and advise on the um, partnership projects. And for this year, we have agreed to to fund some of the shortfall through, through um, some of the monies within the partnership. And we are still uh, fighting this corner, I have to say. And I'm, I'm talking to Paul, uh, the medical director at the ICB, about uh, how we sort of continue. Because it's really important that we have clinicians leading these projects and pieces of work um, uh, you know, across our partnership. So I don't think at the moment we probably wouldn't, because we're just recruited to a lot of these posts that we hadn't had in post, so we wouldn't notice a decline at the moment. It's just that we were expecting to have these new people in post and uh, a sort of stronger sense of clinical leadership. And I think that's it's disappointing that that so suddenly has been uh, reduced. But as I say, we are continuing to fund it at the moment, but that's um, time limited funding from kind of some of the partnership. I can't hear anything now, but I don't know if that's we lost no, I can't hear anything. Can you hear us now, Louise? Yes, yes. Ah, we've now. got you back. Sorry. Is partly is is this you you alluded to the financial pressure? Is this because of where we are at variance to the financial plan and the double lock signing off of anything over fifty thousand and all all of this? And there's such greater scrutiny now that things you were planning to do can't happen or aren't happening as quickly as you hoped. Uh, it's not really to do with the double lock. It's more to do with um the expectation that we have a balanced plan financially uh, across the system and that the ICB are expected to take large amounts of those that cost improvement out of their structures rather than out of provider structures however their money is our money you know it's um it sounds better if it comes out of the icb of course but actually in reality it's for things like this um so it is yeah directly related to the massive financial problems that we have at the moment across the whole of northeast london thank you and so amy do you want to carry on with um the commission side yeah sure thank you um <laughs> so you've got uh, two charts here, which are structured charts, um, and we have been through about uh, about two years almost of restructure, which has finally landed in terms of what ICB staffing will look like from the 1st of December um, 2023. So um, the place structures, uh, our place structure is very, very similar to our former place structure. Um, you can see most of the posts are almost like for like. So we retain um, we retain our old programs. They've been reworked slightly into a life course approach, which is consistent with the rest of the ICB. Um, but most of the areas have uh, similar bandings, similar staff, and the majority of our staff have slotted into posts through the restructure, which is positive. We um, we just have three displaced staff and we have two vacancies. So. We have really minimised um, the disruption to staff from, from that perspective. We've also retained a lot of the staff that have been in place for a very long time in City and Hackney. So we have good organisational memory. You, you mentioned some of the people that come to scrutiny often that you know, and a lot of those are still with us and, and still be with us as we go forward. Um, we continue to um, non-recurrently fund the Neighbourhoods Programme, which is not on here, but we will continue to do that. Um, the, the thing I think which is, is worth the, the conversation, and this is where the devil is in the detail a little bit, is around um, the support functions. And those are the things that you can see in the, um, the white boxes, so medicines management, business support, finance contracting, primary care, quality and safeguarding, um, planned care and comms and engagement. And um, 
These have followed a, a different sort of a timeline. These are all now centralized functions. Um, generally, there have been reductions of, um, I don't know, 20, 30% to these core teams. Most of them um, have taken staff from the places into them, reduced the capacity slightly, and then um, given places th their own sort of staff member, if you like, but with central reporting. So a good example of that is communications, um, where our very well-known comms and engagement manager um, now is part of central team, but is actually allocated back to Sejim Hackney. So, so some of these areas are still working through that. We got a list of planned care staff yesterday. We keep our, our wonderful old planned care manager attached to Sejim Hackney. So, um, this is the bit that is not completely landed, and this is the bit where I think we might see a bit of a reduction in capacity. Um, but that that's, we just need to, to wait and play some of that out as we go forward. So th th just trying to get my, my, my headlines around the, the headlines of, of, of the staff structure about where this is landing. Mm -hmm. Some reduction in support staff mm -hmm. and technically working at ICS, but then sort of brought back to place. Yeah. And a reformulated structure but the existing people have slotted into but one of the big areas of concern that's going on discussions going on is, is on the clinical side and and that reduction is that is that right is that is that and, it, and, it, and it's and it's the source of you, you you don't need to agree to this but the bottom the, the bottoming down or the leveling down to possibly other people on the clinical side whereas we've been is that right whereas we've been used to and the evidence has shown it's worked strong strong clinical leadership and we're concerned about the consequences of that reduction yeah i think i think those are all the the absolute key messages um and yeah absolutely fair interpretation but where are we i think you alluded to amy on the, the funding on the allocation i mean when all this was started about three four years ago we were sort of told 80 20 you know 20 percent would be um at the central and they, you know there'd still be 80 percent to be spent down at place i mean is that is that completely gone now have, have they admitted that, that, that i mean i mean to, to use an example at the point that the um gp and feds contracts start to come up as we have we have placed got that money to reallocate or have we not got that money to reallocate so i think it's fair to say it's still quite murky um and louise will have a view on this as well um we we don't talk about 80 20 any longer sadly <laughs> <laughs> we um but there is still a narrative about if slash when there is a devolution of budgets to place. So we um, we have a place directors meeting with the ICB every week. Somebody always mentions it. Um, so I, I think places are still very um, fighting very hard to, to help make that happen. But we are no clearer on when or if that might be. Louise? Yeah, sorry, my um, reception goes in and out a bit, but um, I think the leveling down point is a really, a really interesting one, and uh, I think everyone is certainly sick of us, um, which is good, uh, going on and on about the fact that, uh, which I do regularly, um, say that um, the problem in North East London is not that City and Hackney are doing really well as far as our place-based services. The problem is that other areas aren't. Um, and sometimes it's seen as a problem that City and Hackney is doing better than other places and therefore it's inequitable. Uh, the inequity is, is a problem, but, but caused by uh, lack of resource in other places as opposed to vice versa. And people, I do genuinely think people have got that um i don't think there's, there's certainly not been a kind of right well we're going to take you know 25 percent out of city and hackney and only five percent out of havering or something that has not happened and and in fact even when these discussions happen these discussions happen i can see people turn to look at me when it's happening waiting for me to say we're not going to level you know we're not leveling down we're leveling up so all the work that's gone on with lobbying for that, I do think is making a difference. I think where we may see a difference is growth monies, if any ever ever come in. Um, I don't know if they will, because uh, the NHS is in a you know in a difficult position. But if growth monies are to come in, then um, that's when I think the discussions will be happening about well, 
we need to put those growth monies into you know places that have poor primary care for example um and obviously we'll we'll fight the grand fight at that at that point but um yeah i i feel pretty sure that this has gone on across and the clinical leadership stuff has definitely gone on across all places not just city and hackney uh everybody is feeling the same degree of pain i think yeah can i i could come back on that i think um the that we've always been very lean and mean in terms of our, our staffing structure and city and hackney and i think that served us really well um we we've only done one cut of it one submission other areas have had to do several um and I, so i think that's yeah there is there is a sense that everybody is in a, a similar difficult position um yeah all right um thank you uh, thanks very both very much for the a, a, a clear update on where we are um that's very helpful members any um any questions following on from that um well thank you both for your work um and uh lobbying and fighting hackney's corner on this um so thank you um with that then i'm going to um draw that item to a close and draw the meeting to a close and we've got one further meeting scheduled now at the 20th of december yeah. fairly late um that has to be rescheduled because of um her as i understand it so thank you everybody um, i know minutes can i have minutes agreed the work program work program i take it as agreed unless there's a sort of particular is there a particular issue or suggestion on it no yeah well thank you very much everybody i'll close the meeting thank you thank you